Good evening. Uh, really great to see uh, everybody here. My name is Paul Goldbart. I'm uh, fortunate to serve as the Dean of the College of uh, Natural Sciences here at the University of Texas at Austin. Tonight's event is part of our college series of conversations that span interests from across the university. We have an exciting panel discussion ahead with true experts in tonight's cross-cutting conversation topic, the future of science communications. I'm delighted to be with members of our community, alumni, faculty, staff, students, and university friends from natural sciences, as well as from the Moody College of Communication and across our beautiful, if a little chilly, campus. Tonight's topic could not come at a more important time. Worldwide, interest in science and mathematics is growing. In fact, I don't think public interest in these topics has ever been stronger or more authentic. Gone are the days when my airplane neighbors put on their headphones as soon as they heard I was a theoretical physicist. What a difference a few years can make. According to a Pew Research Center report, the number one topic people say they would like to see more news about is scientific discoveries. Science-related topics are among the fastest growing subjects of interest on several social media platforms. The most popular movies in recent years include films like Interstellar and The Big Bang Theory ranked among television's most popular shows. We scientists finally have our place in US culture. So why is there such heightened interest in science and mathematics? Perhaps fascination and close engagement with their applications. Our rapidly evolving technologies, our biomedical advances, triggered this development of pronounced and enduring public interest. Still, I've noticed people's interests run deeper into the fundamentals. With my airplane companions, I've had more conversations than you'd imagine about things like the Higgs boson, the long sought after final piece of our current best picture of the building blocks of matter. And my seatmate's headphones remained off. Their heads, that is, not just turned off, but there to. <laughs> All of us can play a role in being good ambassadors for science, making excellent communication a defining feature of our work. When public skepticism rears its head, we must embrace every opportunity to reveal not only the truth, but also the inherent and inspiring beauty of science and mathematics. Before I invite up our panel, it's my great pleasure to recognize excellent science communication from within our community. In the College of Natural Sciences, we celebrate outstanding public engagement through bestowing our annual College of Natural Sciences Outreach Excellence Award. This award celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. I'm very pleased to acknowledge this year's winning program, UT Brainstorms, led by our, by our Department of Neuroscience. Now in its third season of conversations about the brain, UT Brainstorms has forged meaningful connections between members of the Central Texas community and leading experts in brain research. The monthly offerings include presentations and discussions that cover weighty subjects, such as Alzheimer's disease, addiction, brain development in children, and much more. What makes a UT Brainstorms event memorable is how each conversation truly goes two ways. Our neuroscientists are engaging with visitors to campus, fielding questions and learning from the audience's experience. To accept the 2019 College Outreach Excellence Award for UT Brainstorms, I, I now invite up our Chair of the Department of Neuroscience and my colleague, Dr. Michael Mork. Thanks, Mike, for everything you do. And now to our panel. I'm delighted that we're able to host tonight's panel with experts in science journalism, communications, and research. We learned that one of our scheduled panelists could not be here tonight. 
Former CBS News anchor Mr. Dan Rather had a business issue arise that required him to stay in New York unexpectedly. He asked specifically that we convey his regrets for the late change of plans. We are privileged to extend a warm, well, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, a Texas <laughs> welcome to tonight's panelists. Panelists, one at a time, please come up to the stage as I read each of your names and introduce you to our audience. First, Kenneth Chang. Ken Chang <laughs> has been a science reporter at the New York Times since the year 2000. He covers chemistry, geology, condensed matter physics, nanotechnology, Pluto, plague, and other scientific miscellany. Before joining the Times, Mr. Chang was a science writer for abcnews.com and wrote for numerous outlets, including the Star Ledger in Newark and the Los Angeles Times, where he, and I quote, began his reporting career after abandoning, I would say opting out, <laughs> of his graduate studies in physics. Mr. Chang previously worked as a research programmer at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in Champaign, Illinois. He graduated cum laude with a BA in physics from Princeton University and re received an MS in physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, as well as a graduate certificate in science writing from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Welcome, Ken, who I first had the pleasure of meeting about 32 years ago. It's really great to have you with us. Next. Lauren, Lauren Grush. <laughs> Lauren is a science reporter for The Verge and uh, the technology and culture brand from Vox Media. Lauren specializes in all things space, from distant stars and planets to human spaceflight and the commercial space race. The daughter of two NASA engineers, she grew up surrounded by space shuttles and rocket scientists. She is the host of Spacecraft, an original online video series that examines what it takes to send people to space. She is also an alumna of UT Austin, where she received a bachelor's degree in journalism uh, and, and a bachelor's degree in government. Welcome. Our third panelist, yeah. <laughs> Our third panelist is Dr. Joe Hansen, a science writer, biologist, and YouTube educator. Joe is the creator and host of two PBS Digital Studios programs, Hot Mess, a web series about climate change, and It's Okay to Be Smart, an award-winning science education show celebrating curiosity and the pleasure of discovery. He received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and his PhD in cell and molecular biology, both from the University of Texas at Austin. Joe's science writing has been published by Wired, Nautilus, Scientific American, and Texas Monthly. He also serves on the board of directors and strategic planning committee for Austin's public television station, KLRU. Welcome, Joe. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Anthony Dudo, associate professor in the Stan... <laughs> I'll get the pattern shortly. Associate Professor in the Stan Richards School of Advertising and Public Relations here at UT Austin. Dr. Dudo's research focuses on the intersection of science, media, and society, with a focus on scientists' public engagement activities, media representations of science and environmental issues, and the contributions of informational and entertainment media to public perceptions of science. He's the former chair of the Communicating Science, Health, Environment, and Risk Division of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication, the Program Director for Science Communication in the UT Center for Media Engagement, and the Faculty Committee Chair of UT's Cross-Disciplinary Minor in Science Communication. Anthony, thank you for moderating tonight, and with great enthusiasm, I now turn the discussion over to you. Thank you. Are we ready to have fun? Is that on? Yes? Can you hear me? OK. Let's start with something easy. Let's let everyone get to know you a little bit. Could you each take a moment just to talk about your journey into the world of science communication? How did you get to this point? What did that look like for you? <laughs> OK. So um, uh, Dean Goldbarser alluded to this. 
Um, I took the longest, most indirect route by going to graduate school in physics at University of Illinois for seven years before leaving without my PhD. Um, um, and from there, I went to UC Santa Cruz, which has a speci specific science communication program for taking disgruntled, disappointing, <laughs> bored scientists and helping them transition into writing. And from there, I hopped among various internships and temporary jobs. So I was uh, the Los Angeles Times, the Greenwich Time in Connecticut, the New York Star Ledger. The first real job I had was abcnews.com in Seattle. Um, and then somehow the New York Times decided they wanted to hire me. So <laughs> um, that's as it's not the career path I would recommend for anyone, but it actually worked out well. <laughs> yeah, mine is drastically different. <laughs> I would call mine the millennial career path, I guess. Um, it, I knew I wanted to go to New York. I did not know at the time when I graduated that I wanted to be a science writer. I just knew I wanted to be a journalist and uh, New York was in my crosshairs. So uh, I set up a bunch of job interviews right after college and uh, one of them stuck. I got a job as an assistant at Fox and then um, from there I knew I wanted to write about science, didn't know exactly what yet, so I marched down to uh, the digital uh, floor and convinced someone to let me write for them. Got a lot of experience doing that, and then over time I realized I wanted to do, I wanted to write about space specifically. Uh, and from there I made a connection at, with someone at Popular Science who graciously hired me as an assistant editor and uh, convinced them to let me write about space while I was there. And then I saw a job application for The Verge, where I'm currently at now, uh, and it was like, we want someone who writes about NASA, the, the commercial space industry, and I was like, oh, they want me to come work for them. <laughs> and so I applied, and I got the job, and it's been a wild ride ever since. My path into science communication started uh, here in graduate school at UT, I think out of an initial frustration at parties from talking to people and just getting this like blank stare in return when I would try to explain what the heck I was doing. And um, so me and some me and some of my classmates in, in the program started doing live events here just on the drag at, at, uh, at Austin's Pizza and, and, and doing what was this very innovative thing called a science cafe back then. So we'd invite scientists from UT and you know, drinks and beers and hear them talk. Um, we were able to meet some people who are doing early science communication online on these things that used to be called, uh, they used to be really popular, they're called blogs. Um, <laughs> and I started one and it, it got uh, wildly popular and my advisor found it one day and, and, and we decided that maybe there was something in this. So I was lucky enough to get a position, a uh, fellowship through AAAS at a program called the Mass Media Fellowship, which is a fantastic route into science writing, science communication, uh, and journalism for anyone in the, in the scientific community. Um, it was, it's like boot camp for, for journalism. And I was lucky enough to be, I uh, worked at Wired Magazine and uh, got an email one day from PBS asking if I'd ever want to translate what I was doing in a video. And six years later, I'm still working on, on, that, on that slow translation of, of, of figuring that, that weird path out every day. That's great. I, I think one thing that probably most of us in the audience would all agree on is looking at your work is that you bring a great deal of expertise, but also a great deal of passion to what you do. And um, so with that in mind, I'd love to get a dig in and get a better sense from each of you about why you think the work you do in science communication more broadly is salient, timely, and really darn important. Well, I think for me specifically, I'm, I'm very passionate about writing about the commercial space industry, and right now that's just in a great time of transition and flux, and there's something new and crazy happening every couple months, and it's kind of hard to keep up, but it's also kind of thrilling to see what's going to happen next. I mean, you, just the other day, um, you know, SpaceX launched a, another batch of satellites to beam internet down to earth you know there's something crazy like that that's happening and i think in in terms of our readership people are very 
they, they are very interested in that as well. So I, I really like kind of tracking those new changes and kind of keeps, it keeps me on my toes, which, is, which makes the job more exciting, you know, each and every day. I mean, has anyone tried following the political news on their own these days? I mean, it's, it's impossible to, to keep up with the volume of commentary and opinions and developments. Well, science puts out like a thousand times more output than, than even what political Twitter can muster. <laughs> um, and so the, the, no human, no person can keep up with that on their own. So th as scientific output continues to grow, then the need for people communicating and translating and critiquing that will of course grow too. Um, and of course, like the back to the future date uh, from October 2015, I mean, that's like already more than four years in the past. So it's, it's very cliche to say it, but it's, it's, it's crucial and critical to being a, like a functioning citizen today to, to have some connection and, and, and be able to at least be aware of the developments in many scientific fields. And um, one of the great fun things about being a science reporter is you have to ask the really basic, simple questions that everyone thinks about. You know, where did life come from? What happened before the Big Bang? Um, how big is the universe? So that there's basic fundamental questions that you don't have to be a scientist with you know, years of graduate school to appreciate what the question is. And, and that's sort of what makes people special and that there's this innate curiosity. I think it's, it's great that this part of the news business actually feeds in that curiosity, which hopefully spreads into the other parts of, of the society. Yeah, I like to think of it as I'm still in college and my job, you know, I'm still learning and I get private tutors just talking to me every day. You know, it's such a privilege. I can call up a professor and have them explain their research to me, you know, no problem. I think that's really something special. That's great. Um, and I guess I, I, I want to continue with this, this general idea and, you know, science communication is kind of a broad concept, right? And it means different things to different people. But I wanted to talk about, just based on your experience and from your perspectives, like who is a science communicator? We often talk about science journalists as science communicators. Is, is that accurate? Is it broader than that? Who is a science communicator in your experience? Yeah, we have all have a complicated relationship with that term, I think. I, sometimes it's super useful because it captures so many things, but that also means it can be super useless because science communication is so many things. I mean, like a teacher is communicating science to students. A journalist is, is putting this in context for society and, and critiquing developments as well as trying to inform people. People are doing policy. Uh, they're doing funding. I mean, they're, they're, there's, a, there's a, a laundry list of what falls underneath this. Um, so the answer is so many different kinds of people are doing science communication. Um, and that really makes it a challenge when you're thinking about how to create more science communicators, create good ones, um, because that isn't just one thing. Uh, you know, we, we all sort of ha maybe have a background in journalism or certain kinds of communication, but there are, you know, multitudes of people doing this in different ways. Yeah, I think I kind of shy away from the term science communicator as in terms of what I do. I try to stick more with journalists, and I think it's an important distinction because with science communication, there can sometimes be like a cheerleading aspect to it, which is not bad, but it's just a different thing that I do where I'm kind of looking into, you know, what certain companies are doing or, you know, is, you know, is the way that uh, the science that is being done you know, is there criticism of what's what's being done there? It's it's more of taking more of like a critical eye on these stories, and not to say that science communicators don't do that, but um, I it, I think it's just a, a, a little distinction that's crucial but necessary, and that that's more of what I I strive for. How about you, Ken? I guess I always see science communicators a broader term that includes science journalists, but um, has other people like museum writers and um, teachers that are broader and have actually different goals. So when I write an article about a transistor or the Big Bang, I'm not trying to fill in all the physics education that you may have missed. Um, although I, I want, to, I'm hopefully conveying some of the gist of this important science, but it's not my role to sort of 
teach science from, you know, from the building blocks, and, which is very important, but that's other people's jobs. That's great. Um, so presumably, you're interacting with scientists and folks who generate knowledge on a daily basis multiple times, right? And so I, I want to kind of get a sense from you all about, like a, a more granular sense about what that, what that looks like. Specifically, when you have an interaction with, you know, a scientist source that goes really well, why did it go really well? Conversely, when you have an, you know, <laughs> an interaction with a scientist where it goes really wrong, like, what's the difference? What's behind the difference there in that exchange of information in that interaction? Well, I think for me, I was saying this earlier, like, one of the questions I ask time and time again as, you know, explain your research to me like I'm five or explain it to me as if you were drinking at a dinner party. You know, I, I'm looking for some kind if, if I can understand it, then I have a better time of conveying to the audience or the reader how they'll be under, uh, able to understand it. So um, it's getting rid of that the jargon that we, you know, a, an expert will commonly use and is really comfortable um, using. But I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, I want to hear the crazy synonym that you've come up with for, you know, how black holes, you know swirl around each other or something like that. You know, I want I want to hear it in a fun way that we all can understand and and not something that's going to um, be a barrier to, to people that feel intimidated by this certain type of science. So getting a good quote is just the best feeling, one that, you know, really is easy for people to get. And um, yeah, just having them explain things to me in a way that just clicks. When, when that happens, it's like such a good feeling. You're like, all right, I got it. I know how to put the story together. Um, there have also been times when I've been talking to scientists where I'm like, well, I have absolutely no idea about this topic any more so than I did before I got on the phone. Um, and that's a really uh, scary time. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's when, it's when they just explain it for you in that way that you're like, okay, I've got it. I have a good grasp of the information. And that's when it's a really good experience. I guess the difference is when a scientist sort of understands what we're trying to do, which is trying to convey some information to the general public, and sort of buys into that. Um, because a lot of times the scientists are concerned about what their peers are going to see about them talking to the New York Times, as opposed to um, it's good for you know, someone who's not a scientist to learn about my latest research. If they do that, then they can start seeing or thinking about um, and try to think about how can I best convey this. And you know, sometimes I'll throw out a pithy statement that will work, and then I'll try to fill in some of the details, which is what we want as well. Um, I mean, one of the scariest questions I get from scientists is, do you have a science background? <laughs> um, and my response is typically, yes, but please assume that I'm dumb. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's the most dangerous thing for them and for me is that they start thinking I'm another scientist or that they can talk to at their level. And it's dangerous for me to start thinking I'm at that level too because that's basically when I will misunderstand something basic and get it wrong. Um, so, uh, so I was actually one of the people I was speaking to today was Mariva Ja, who's this computer science engin engineer who's working on space um, debris in low Earth orbit, and he's talking. He was showing me his beautiful graphics of the system that he's developing to sort of um, track all these debris, and he came up with these great quotes like, "I'm to trying to come up with the with ways for low Earth orbit." So ways is that the crowdsource traffic management system, uh, app. And so that was, I wrote down the quote I because- say, That's a great quote. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that is one, short, two, really encapsulates what he's trying to do, and three, everyone, at least who knows what Waze is, understands what he's doing without any jargon. You know, science is, is a human endeavor. It's done by people. Um, and so a funny thing happens when you're interviewing scientists sometimes. You get through like all the questions you've prepared and like wrapping it up and you, most of us probably ask like, oh, you have anything else you want to, you know, that I didn't ask you, anything else you want to add? And all of a sudden like their prepared scientist statement 
veneer falls away and they're like, oh yeah, well, you'll never believe like the, you know, the third month we're working on this, my, co you know, they, and they, they jump into some amazing story that, that, uh, and like these are the moments you've been waiting for. It's like, it's the humanity behind this science and these, it's, this is what brings the emotion and the color and the passion of what these people do that, that can make it resonate with people who have never entered these universes, um, you know, trying to capture those moments. Um, and we sort of have to play these strange armchair psychologists to get there sometimes, reading these, these very unique people <laughs> to get there. Um, but bad interactions, um, lots of scientists have had negative interactions with, with the press or with people trying to communicate their science. Um, and there is often a distrust that they take out on the next person they talk to. So it's, it's important that we, that we are able to, you know, create an environment where scientists feel safe talking. They don't think they're going to get burned by, by what we're going to do with their work. Um, so it's a, it's a huge responsibility that we have so that the next person that talks to them after us doesn't get it ruined for them. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, it's interesting to hear you bring up this notion of humanity. You probably know there's a wellspring of science communication training programs that have popped up all over in the last 10 to 15 years in, in North America and, and, and in America especially. Um, and many of them are starting to focus in on this notion of developing empathy and humanizing scientists. Also, along with uh, get rid of your jargon, more accessible, elevator pitch, et cetera. So it's interesting to hear you comment about that. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit, and this is kind of maybe one of the questions that's a little bit more wonky, so just, just bear with me. Right, social scientists, we like to talk about this thing called norms. And so, you know, like what's, what are the normal operating procedures within a certain profession, right? And so as people who are journalists, you, you know what your norms are. And you've kind of talked through some of those in your answers already. Um, you know, I'm curious, like to what extent do you think the norms of your own trade are similar or different from those that we see within the scientific enterprise? Sorry, I'm laughing because I work on YouTube. Like the idea of anything being normal on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's that that's a that's a, a, a significant challenge for working in an environment um, that you know it's it's social media based. Like so much of what we do is, and um, it's we're put in competition in very real ways with other media that does not have any of these operating principles. Um, in in in, in some ways is working actively and you know opposed to the kind of things that and principles that we're trying to to get out there um, and so making getting our voice out there and and, and just com completing this communication endeavor is, is incredibly challenging depending on the environment so um, trying to take journalistic norms and practices into a wild west of of online media is is challenging for for everybody I think I like to think of each um, article that I write or video that I do as kind of a puzzle. And it's basically taking a lot of what you said about, you know, trying to make sure that people see your work, but at the same time, taking the information that you're getting from the scientist or from the expert and distilling it in a way that still gets a point, gets, gets across, you know, what the story is about and what the information is, but also picking and choosing which parts are important and which parts are not important. And a lot of the times a scientist will disagree with you on which part is important to include and which part my editor thinks is important to include. And um, I'm constantly kind of a liaison between those two points of being, you know, fighting for certain things that I think are important to include and then other things that, you know, the reader just doesn't need to know that. And um, so, it, it, each yeah, each time I approach a story, it really is just trying to figure out okay, how do I say how do I convey what needs to be said, and then how do I sell it and make it you know translate it in a way that people will understand and read, and then also come up with the right headline that pe will grab people's attention, but also convey the right information. Like you don't want to make sure you want to make sure that your headline is accurate, but also you know, an, uh, uh, exciting enough so that people will read the story. So it's a con each, each story is just kind of like a constant checklist and puzzle of, you know, getting those things together in this right, perfect order and creating this masterpiece when you're done, which I, don't know, I wouldn't say each story is a masterpiece, but 
it really does. It, it is kind of a, a trial from start to finish. Yeah, and it's interesting you use the word that each time it's a negotiation, yeah. right? Uh, it's, yeah. Um, I hope the norms of journalism haven't changed too much. I'm just thinking when radio came along, and you know, radio was very different from print, but the norms of radio reports were the same, and the same with TV. So Walter Cronkite had the same no fair ideas of what journalism should be compared to what the New York Times has. And even with web and blog, and I guess even Twitter up to some extent, um, the journalist part still want to do most of the same things. Um, at least I hope so. And although, I mean, the medium obviously has changed and you can do present the, the science and other stories in new and different ways, which is great, mm -hmm. because that way there's more tools and you have better ways to explain things that are hard to explain in words or even within video that you can do interactively on the web. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I've actually noticed more of a norm change among scientists in the last three decades, mm -hmm. because in the past, the culture of science is that you had to focus on your research and, and that you know, communicating science was sort of a diversion from where you should be spending your time. Mm -hmm. And now there actually seems to be a component in, in you know, graduate, stu graduate education, um, even I guess among starting professors, that you know, talking to the public is actually something that's good and to be encouraged, not to be looked down on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good change. Um, and I'm going to piggyback on that with, with my provocative question that you won't get offended by because it's it, this is all in good fun, I promise. Um, you know, you alluded to a couple of you to the obviously the rapid change in our media ecosystem, right? And if there was ever a time when scientists, the way they'd communicate to you know larger audiences would be through gatekeepers like science journalists. Well, now we can pull out a phone and I can tweet and do whatever and I can communicate theoretically with whomever I want as quickly as I want, direct to consumer science. With that technology in mind, why do scientists still need journalists? We, allude, we, we mentioned all the different kinds of science communication that are out there. And um, you know, for, for getting the word about your research out for funding purposes, for educational purposes, for local community impact, for university relevancy, you know, all that tenure package kind of stuff. Um, that is, those are the easy answers for, for why scientists should communicate, right? But, um, and, and why the erasing of gatekeepers is an advantage to them. But you talked about our friend Elon Musk launching a bunch more internet satellites into orbit. Um, and that's where this cult of personality uh, kind of uh, blessing can become quite the opposite because who's holding that to account? And that is where this critical role is still so important to say, hold up, Teslas are really cool, but are we gonna, how are we gonna deal with multiple centuries of a, of a polluted night sky? No one asked us, no one asked the rest of the world. And so maybe the job of the journalist is to speak for them and, and, and to hold something to account. And there are multiple examples, great examples over the past years of, of this happening. Well, so certainly with companies, we can't just take what they say at face value, you know. They'll tell us that something is good and, you know, it's our job to say, okay, wait a minute, let's ask experts and make sure that what they're saying is true, especially, you know, the Starlink is such a great example because, it, you know, it is important to question, will this pollute our night sky or is it as big of a deal as astronomers are making it out to be because they're very passionate about their work right now and maybe they're overthinking it. It's a, it's a very complicated topic. When it comes to scientific research, it's also not our job just to regurgitate what a paper is saying. Um, every time that I write about a new scientific discovery, my after I talk to the researcher, my next job is to contact someone who was not involved with that work and have them look over this paper and tell me whether or not, you know, this is legit, if they have criticisms about it. And, you know, sometimes people are in agreement that this is solid work. Other times, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a hoopla over this one study about um, a, it was a super earth that may have water, water vapor in its atmosphere. So I talked to the researcher and it seemed like, oh my God, we had found another Earth that had water in its atmosphere. This is the biggest discovery of all time. Then I called somebody else 
And they were like, absolutely not. This is not even a rocky planet. It's filled with gas. You couldn't even live on it. You'd freeze to death. And uh, the fact that it, we don't even know, you know, what it would look like. And it's, you know, I think it, it's basically a hostile very planet and you should not call it a super earth at all. So that threw me into a tizzy because I was like, I don't know how to communicate this. So I ended up calling a bunch of people, turned into a completely different story than the, the one that the um, original researchers were selling to me. And so I think having that, be, having people who can pull together all these different points of view is critical when you have papers or researches, research like that, that, that is kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm working? It, it, you know, not, not everyone is in agreement about it. That's great. How about you, Ken? Um, I guess it's, there's sort of this idealistic view of the internet where you could just take out all the middlemen and everything. So you could take out the journalists and you could have scientists talking directly to the public. Um, but as, as these people have um, uh, sort of alluded to that there's a ton of sources that don't conflict. And if you haven't been following this field for at least a little bit or knowing whom to ask, it's very hard to in untangle in real time. And most scientists don't have the time to translate their own work to talk to the audience. Most people don't um, have the time to do this exhaustive search among all the scientists and try to figure out who's credible and who's not credible and, and to do the data analysis. So, um, and so there's still a role, I think, for journalists to tell a story, to take all these different parts and try to synthesize it into one story that hopefully gives an overview of what's going on and gives a fair representation among all the, uh, the company of, of, of you know, reality. Yeah, I will add that context, I think, is one thing that sets us apart as journalists. Our ability to add crucial context to a story um, is what sets us apart from just kind of regurgitating the information and then actually you know, providing a service for people for, so that they understand the setting that the story is in and not just the, the latest information that they have. As someone who's a lot of the work I do is, is, is not this critical type of journalism where I'm holding everyone who I talk to their, their feet to the fire, I am in many ways trying to help researchers translate sterile work into narratives that are, you know, w that have emotion and that the people can, can at least get access to, to new kinds of information, you know, celebrating it, if, if you will. Um, so I do think on the whole, this trend toward erasing gatekeepers, minimizing gatekeepers, more direct access for anyone with, um, you know, with, with these messages is a good trend. We're coming up with new ways to, to correct and, and, and find the balance for that to make sure that people never have too much power. Um, you know, there, there have been multiple cases of, you know, God, there, was a, there was a guy who was partially funded by Monsanto who was making up this entirely fake radio show to say good things about his own research. Um, and he was, you know, science journalism, figure out new ways to get around this, you know, who, somebody invented a fake podcast. That's not a problem anybody had to, had to, to deal with in the journalism community years ago. Um, so we're, we are coming up with new ways to do that. But I think on, on the whole, this trend is great. It's, it's, it's allowed new voices, um, new platforms, new, new demographics have, are, are finding these things relevant and, and finding ways into it. Um, we're just kind of faced with new challenges of, of finding ways to, to keep to, to do the scientific kind of correction to keep that uh, in check. Um, one of the things, actually, Joe, that you brought up earlier was the fact that not all communication is created equal, right? Sometimes the communication is really effective. Sometimes it's the exact opposite, sometimes in between. And Ken, you mentioned the fact that it seems like there's this kind of change within the norms of academia where scientists are increasingly incentivized and or interested to get out of their labs and engage and do outreach. So I guess my, my, my question for you on that is, um, if we're interested in improving science communication, um, like who are the key stakeholders? Who, sh who should be really, who should be doing that? I mean, we could start right here at UT, right? What's the role of the modern American R1 university or liberal arts college, or whatever, in making the future generations of scientists more effective communicators? Sort that out for us, would you? <laughs> so you're telling a massive university what they should do. Um, in, in many ways, it's already happening. I, I think you're seeing uh, conversations like this would be unheard of when I was in, in school. I had to sneak away 
don't ever tell my advisor. I don't know if he's here. Um, <laughs> one day for a, the NSF brought in like an afternoon workshop on like basic science communication skills and like how to stand there and deliver your research in one minute kind of thing. And I went, like, literally were like writing, you know, sneaking off for a long lunch and not coming back to lab to do these things because we were. It was, it was such a chilling environment for this being acceptable. Um, so merely creating an environment where this is is supported and fostered and. Uh, that it's that it's feeding back into actual performance of of, of young professors, of funding decisions. The funding agencies are, are are holding these things to account in terms of of broader impacts and really starting to put the money, literally where their mouth is. And I think that is making um, these are the the broad systemic changes as well as just the good old generational change of younger professors who care about this stuff and understand, um, you know, the, have had the experience of, of communicating in this new world. Um, as they become younger deans, you know, this will, will continue to get, no, I'm just, um, <laughs> um, so we're, we're creating these environments in a very real way and it's happening, it's happening surprisingly quickly. Well, I think, um, first of all, I think it's just a miracle that uh, researchers talk to me every day with, you know, that I can, I'm able to get people on the phone and, and just have them tell me my research. I really, I mean, every time I speak with someone, it is true, I'm so truly grateful that they've taken the time out of their day to do this because I know how busy they are and, and how much time that takes up. And a lot of the time I'm asking questions that they might be frustrated with, but that are very, really helpful for me. But I also would say it is very important, I mean, if they can spare that time because with so many different types of websites and uh, new media, it is very easy for bad information to spread very quickly. And there have been often times where I've spent a whole day uh, writing a story based on a viral story that's gone out and having to kind of correct the record. Uh, I think one of my favorites was, I don't know how this got about, but. Um, a NASA astronaut Scott Kelly went to the International Space Station and some uh, report circulated that I think like 25% of his DNA had changed while he was in space. And everyone was like, holy crap. Even Scott Kelly was like, wow, this is insane. And it's like, mm, you would be a chicken or something. At the, you know, like, you would not be... <laughs> and it, it was... Um, uh, I can't quite recall the, the, the... It was epigenetics, I believe. Like... The um, it changed, but it changed back basically. Or, and um, so I spent all day kind of working on that. But stories like that, there, I we talk about these with I talk about it with other space reporters. It's like those are the kinds of ones that will derail our day. And so, um, uh, and but then the damage gets done pretty quickly. I mean, I, I hope that people read my story afterward or other people's corrective stories, but. I'll have, oftentimes people will read that first story and then, you know, have an inc incorrect perception of what's going on. That's great. How about, how about you, Ken? What, what can we as UT Austin and our sister schools do to, to help science communication get better? So, um, first thing, I mentioned that the science, the culture of scientists has changed. Um, although it's, it's scientists I've, I've found through my entire career, you th I think like, okay, he's at the New York Times, of course they're going to return the f my phone call. But even when I was um, at the Greenwich Time, which is a 10,000 circulation newspaper in, in the middle of Greenwich, Connecticut, um, I would just call random people at major universities and they would generally call me back. And so there was always an interest among scientists. They were actually happy to talk to someone about their science um, and, and, and spend their time talking to someone, where even when there's not going to be a major um, audience for it. What would help? And what I think is, is changing is that this is now, I guess, a higher priority so that perhaps this is being taken into account during tenure decisions or that there's training for graduate students on how to do science writing. So I was back at University of Illinois earlier this year, um, which was a very traumatic experience because they actually wanted me, <laughs> they actually wanted me to talk at the physics colloquium, which was, <laughs> it was like that, that whole nightmare of, you know, you forgot to go to class all semester, exactly. and also you had to be at the final exam. <laughs> I had to talk to all these physicists who now suddenly had good thoughts about me. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> but I was impressed that the graduate school at um, the sciences and the engineering school at Illinois 
is now requiring their graduate students to be taking writing classes. And I think that's a great first move. And so if there's more tools um, to sort of help scientists to sort of switch the mode, because you know, it's, it's who your audience is, is how you do effective science communication. You have to understand who your audience is to be able to t figure out how best to tell your story. And there's a great program at, the, at Stony Brook University, um, the Center for Science Communication, and it's a program that Alan Alda started. So he's actually been teaching improv to scientists. And it's not so that they could have riotous um, um, skits about science, but it's basically so that when you're trying to talk to people that you're aware of how you know, your audience is reacting and sort of slowing down when you realize that they're losing your train of thought and going back and going, okay, did I lose you there? Therefore, what, should I, what part do I need to, um, to explain better? And that sort of communication is, is a two-way path that um, is harder when talking to a non-scientist because that's outside your normal peer group. And those are skills that would be great that became part of the normal education of a grad student and a scientist and professors. It, it's also required different parts of universities to start talking to each other a little bit more. Um, these are, I mean, we're scientists. We, we, we want to know why this stuff works and how to do it well in an evidence-based way. And studying science communication can't be done just in the physics department. I mean, you have to, you have to call in uh, different departments that don't traditionally or haven't traditionally intersected with, with uh, you know, the hard sciences, so to speak. And uh, universities that support that see a lot of success, and that's happening here, and I think that's one of the key developments, is you're inviting some of those kinds of science that the hard scientists used to put in air quotes when they would talk about it when those people weren't around. Those sciences are, are, are starting to enter the conversation a little bit more. Um, that's great. Uh, l let me change the topic yet again, uh, but we're still talking a little bit about kind of improving science communication. I've, I've had the, the privilege in my research in the last few years to be spending a lot of time with different kind of groups that are potentially going to play an important role in ratcheting up science communication. So whether they're trainers like ALDA or big fellowship programs like what you know you experienced at AAAS or professional scientific societies, philanthropies, etc. And one thing that we are always talking about is how science communication can help make STEM more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. And so I'm wondering, just based on your experience, if you have any thoughts about how science communication can contribute to the diversification of STEM. Tough question, but an important one. Well, for me, I talked about this earlier today, um, and when in my daily life, what's very important to me is trying really hard to diversify my sources and who I speak to. Um, it's very tough, especially with space journalism, just because it's a very white man-dominated field. Um, it's even, it was even hard for me when I first was getting into it just because there are a lot of men around and I felt very out of place uh, when I was at certain events like launches. I would oftentimes be one of just a few women in the room and uh, that can be really scary to keep going and feel like you're doing your best work. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to uh, how I report my stories, if I'm doing like a, a long-term report, I really try my best to just take that extra effort to find a voice that isn't, you know, the one that, I'm, that we're constantly seeing. And that takes a little bit extra effort, doesn't always work out. And every time that happens, I'm very upset with myself. But just doing that extra effort goes a long way, and um, I think it's fairly important for people to see different types of voices in the stories that they're reading or the, the videos that we're making. Yeah, diversity is, is, an, is an active process, promoting that. I mean, these aren't, this isn't a passive thing that is just going to ride the wave of societal change, um, and it, 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 it involves things like actively sourcing the, 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 the you know, diverse group of people that you want to reflect in, in the work. Um, and this has led to, you know, this isn't just a cute thing to, to promote diversity in society because it's, you know, because it's some great ideal that we all want to point to. That it's, it's really led to, to positive outcomes in bringing new people into STEM. Um, and 
also in the way that we talk about certain issues has been really informed by having diverse voices at the table. I mean, indigenous voices in climate change have, have completely changed the conversation about who and where and how it's impacting different communities. Um, it's changed the conversation of, of women being underrepresented in, in any medical science that has animal models in, in, in certain respects because they don't have the right balance all the way back to the, to the, to the basic uh, lab work. Um, and so bringing different kinds of voices far down the stream uh, in, in science communication has, has fed back and really changed how the work is being done in, in a very positive way, I think. Um, this is a case where social media and technology actually makes it easier or at least possible. Um, I remember when I first started in science journalism, I also had mass media fellowship back in 1991 at the San Francisco Chronicle. At that point, all the information was going back and forth by fax. So if you want to get an article from, they would send you, fax you the, uh, the, the, the press package, and then you had to like fill out a form, check which number of articles you want, fax it to them, and then they would fax you the articles. Um, and you know, and you could, you could, but you didn't have time to actually look up the references, and and there was actually services where you could call up just to see, can this, can you find someone who knows anything about this topic at any university in the U.S. And much so if you could find anyone at all who could talk about this was great, much less trying to figure out, you know, is this, what is this person's ethnic background? Is it, uh, how can I try to increase diversity? So it's great that actually we now actually had the tools to actually start thinking about it. And I think that's um, a good thing. So Ed Young at the Atlantic actually keeps a sort of a tally of, of the gender and the ethnicity of, the, of his sources, and he makes a conscious effort to actually make that he's using a, um, that his his sources are, are as diverse as the population, which I think is actually good. Some people might think that's actually like affirmative action for scientists, but it's one of the things like it's too easy to fall back on people you've talked to in the past. Now, actually, I've, I know like there's one article where it was something about Mars, I think, that someone actually tweeted at me. It's like, you did, couldn't find any woman to talk to about that. And I realized, and that was actually true, because I, it was an article where I didn't have enough time, so I, I sort of took the shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So that, the person was actually right, and that was a function that I didn't do as good a job of reporting on the story as I should have, or, or as I wish I could have. I had the same thing. Someone called me out for, I was on deadline, and I had just called up my, you know, regular sources, and someone was like, you didn't find a single woman to talk to, and it really didn't cross my mind, so now I, I, I make a conscious effort to, to put that at the forefront of my mind, and I don't always succeed, but I, it is, I think that's something that every journalist needs to have at, at the forefront of their mind when they're reporting. It's extra work, it's extra time, and, it, you know, that might not be what's easy, but you know, it's what we need to do. And and so many young women talk to me about just seeing me doing my work. They they feel inspired by uh, a woman writing about space journalism that they would want to do it. And that represent representation is really important and goes a really long way for them. So being able to do that with my sources, I think, is just as important. Uh, wonderful. So I have, I have one more question for you all, and then we're going to segue into a Q&A. So while I ask this question, if any of you have uh, something that you'd like to ask the panelists, the microphone is over here. You can start lining up in the aisle and uh, get ready to ask your question. Um, this, is, this, is our, this is our let's help the audience question. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming there are some folks out here today who are already actively engaging different types of audiences about science and probably many of you that are would-be scientist communicators. For those folks who are standing on the precipice, getting ready to talk more frequently with journalists or to uh, communicate in any of the myriad ways that they can, could you give them, whether it's a piece of advice or a kernel of inspiration or anything that you'd want to, you know, you'd want to share with them to help them as they as they make this transition? I don't know what you're waiting for. <laughs> no one's going to walk up and like invite you to be like, now is your time. You're officially allowed to start. So this is maybe sounds totally unhelpful, but like just start. Um, I started out really, really bad. And I, I, I wrote something like 8,000 blog posts before I got this media fellowship. Um, 
I don't believe in the 10,000 hour, hour rule, but there's something there. I wouldn't have finished my PhD if it took 10,000 10, hours to write all those, but um, it, it is very cliche to just say, just start doing it. Much of this is, is about craft and practice, and that requires repetition the same way that learning the violin does. And so these are skills. They need to be practiced. They need to be learned. They need to be critiqued, and you need to do the work in order to ever get better at it. So like Nike says, just do it. Um, I will say with all of my talk about being critical, one of the main things that I de desperately want with every article that I do is to be accurate and to make sure that I'm explaining things in a way that is truthful but also easy to understand. And having people that I can turn to um, on a regular basis to do that for me is so valuable and I just love them with all my heart and I, uh, I, I know that that doesn't pay the bills, but I know that uh, it goes a long way in terms of me being able to do my job and effectively communicate. So if you are able to be open and talk to journalists and, and, and just you know spare 15 to 20 minutes, that's all I ask when I, when I do an interview. They sometimes go longer, but you know 15 to 20 minutes is all it takes just to kind of break things down for us and and our job, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but for me personally and for many great science communicators out there, all we want is to be able to understand and to to pay it forward. And so it, go, it really goes a long way when you can hop on a phone with us because, you know, we need you. <laughs> yeah, I'll echo that. I guess I'll, I'll be a little bit more cautious in that sort of understand what the role of the journalist is. Um, our job is not to promote science. Um, and so journalists aren't necessarily your friend. We're not the enemy either. Our job is to try to understand the science and convey it accurately. And if you understand that's the role, then you can sort of understand um, that it's helpful to sort of explain things and then sort of, um, uh, sort of nudge people to try to preempt where you think we might under misunderstand something. Um, but we're not going to to be taking size or, or necessarily taking size to promote your stuff or to knock down our competitors. That's, I mean, we, we may, that might be the effect of the article, but we're not taking size when we talk to you. We're trying to, to understand what the story is and to try to portray it accurately, which may have winners and losers, but that's not something we're trying to go in with at the beginning. All right, great. Let's get some questions from the audience. We have a nice, healthy line over there. Howdy, I'm Augustus Hill. And uh, my question is, with the loss of gatekeepers and the rise of like social media, <clears throat> excuse me, social media on the internet, um, how do science communicators combat the intentional spread of misinformation with things like the flat earth theory and uh, anti-vaccination? Things like that. <laughs> Just to name a few. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in my experience, you can't you can't speak louder than than disinformation. Um, one of the, the weird parts about social media and, and this this attention economy that we've developed is that very what what seems very loud is not necessarily very large, um, and when you talk about something like like flat Earth, there's a lot to learn about. You know, science communication in 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 you know t talking to people who supposedly believe this thing that aren't just trolling us all, um, but I I think that you definitely do not want to be taking the efforts that you can speak louder or that you can sp you can have more people speaking versus them. Um, that's that's not the that, that's not the the way that we that we do things in science. And it's not I don't think it's the most effective way of science communication. I think you. Speak about what you know. Um, you you speak to that truth. You you write the you continue to write engaging and uh, honest stories for the people that are coming to that pipeline for that in new information for the very first time. Be their first good experience with that information, and then engage empathy with people who are challenged by that. Understand why they think the way that they do. Don't go versus them, but speak to the reasoning of of, of what brought them to be an anti-vaccination person or or someone who who mistrusts some part of that. Um, so you're you're speaking with them, not against them, not over them. Um, for me, the types of stories that I choose to write about, I think, are very important. Um, I wouldn't say if I outright ignore all those, but I 
get pretty close. Uh, and I, uh, we also did a, a report a while back on the flat earth theory and that the reason that you've probably seen more of it is that the media is covering it more because it, it does bring in a lot of traffic because a lot of people are laughing at it. But at the same time, I find that to be kind of harmful because we don't need to give credence to this. And so for me personally, it's like when a basketball player says he believes the earth is flat, I don't need to cover that. You know, that's not part of my wheelhouse. And so that that's kind of how I combat um, these is like to pick this, don't pick the salacious story just because it's fun to laugh at these people. You know, instead, let's move on and talk about what's actually happening. <laughs> so actually, we kind of mentioned this yesterday in our conversation. Um, the, the latest sociology research is that facts never convinced anyone. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and so the people who, there was always people who didn't believe in vaccines or thought the earth was flat. It's just with social media that these people can now connect with each other um, and sort of reinforce their thoughts, but it, you're never going to convince them anyway, and so that's not who I'm trying to talk to. Um, and so I can just continue writing on you know, Mars and Earth at, at, and all the things that I don't need to take into account that the, there's some people who think the Earth is flat. And hopefully, I mean, hopefully there's ways that in education, K through 12, that we can teach people to be better consumers of information, to be able to judge. And I think that's it. And there's a, a large group of people in the middle who don't have a strong opinion either way about you know, vaccines or climate change and whatnot. And hopefully that if you present enough reasonably articles that sound very reasonable and know, supported by information that they read it and go, okay, this sounds very real and therefore I'll start paying more attention to it. And that's sort of what you hope is that you're moving the middle and not the ends. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just ask our question askers, just again, just say your name and if you could give the panelists just a quick uh, idea of what your role at UT is, whether you're a student, faculty, staff, et cetera. Thanks. Hi, my name is Sammy Koplos. I'm a chemistry major here. I'm a student. Um, I was just wondering that I've, I've noticed that a lot of people tend to click on the articles if they're interested in science or if they have the inherent passion for it. How do you draw in a community of people who doesn't really um, have passion for science without clickbait or without trying to fluff up the things <laughs> that make it interesting to someone who might watch BuzzFeed? <laughs> Hate the word clickbait. <laughs> oh, you, you, you hate clickbait. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of, I, I kind of love it. So you want to go? Well, I tend to find, in terms of, people like to use the word clickbait to criticize a headline I've written or an angle I've taken. When in reality, it's just they didn't like what I wrote about, and that's I don't think that's very fair. Um, but I mean, at the same time, it was like kind of like what I was talking about earlier. I, I feel like it is a constant. Uh, tug of war between writing a headline that in, you know captures people's attention. And then also for me personally, when I write a story, I really, it, it, it can be very hard as I, and I'm in this beat longer and longer. Experience is very valuable, but at the same time it's very easy to kind of uh, turn to those jargon phrases or you know, I start to understand things a bit better and so I kind of turn into the scientist and I turn into the engineer and so, I'm constantly striving with every article that I write to come at it from a, you know, from Lauren starting from day one point of view, still having that expertise for context and whatnot, but also being able to describe, never, never assume that someone knows, you know, how, basics of how rockets work. You know, there are some things that, that we can't, we can just, you know, assume that are basics, but it, it think that every article you write you're starting fresh you know so that's that's try that's how I try and engage people that might feel a little intimidated by space or science coverage clickbait um, I, if I get you to click on on the thing that I made like that's good like that 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 helps support the businesses behind these things it gets the message out there the the sin comes if you bait and switch if if you know, if, if I give you something else than what I tried to sell you. But if I give you exactly what I tried to sell you and I just sold it really well, we'll we all win then. So clickbait can be good. 
yeah, when I done mean, correctly. Yeah, that's, so yeah, um, there's nothing wrong with an enticing headline. If it's m uh, false advertising, that's bad. To get at the substance, though, a little bit, I, I will push back a little bit to say that I don't, I don't know if we do have trouble finding those people. I, I think that, there, that science and, and the passions and the questions and the, the drive behind all that is, is fairly universal. What I'm more concerned about is as these things start to exist on platforms that are not human, um, that when, when they're run by algorithms, when the decisions are being made by, 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 by chips and, and by programs, um, it, it can set in place some, some dangerous uh, feedback loops. And this is something we deal with on YouTube with a, an extreme bias in male-female viewership ratios on, on science videos that do not match any data that says what people say that they're interested in. Um, so we're having to keep a very careful eye on what algorithms are, are, are they're putting in place new filters that we, that we have, as, as people have to keep an eye on the plug and be ready to. And this is like one of the reasons that it's good that there's still places like the New York Times so that someone goes to the site to read the story about whatever happened at the impeachment hearings today, will still see a headline about what NASA's doing or that there's a new discovery and they'll click on that so that, um, and I find there's actually, people are more interested in science than they will think they are. Because if you say like, oh, this is a chemistry story thing, like, no, 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 I don't care about that. But if you talk about, it's a story about this really neat effect with wintergreen lifesavers. <laughs> and then you could tie that into the physics or the chemistry of what happens with bond breaking. And they end up reading a science story and being entertained by it without having been scared off by it being ostensibly science. Thank you, I appreciate it. Hi, my name is Akiko, I'm a student here, and I'm a physics major. So my question is to any of you guys, but more specifically Kenneth, because your background is in physics, like me. Um, and so I had a question how, <laughs> what would you say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody says that they're sorry for me, but like I chose it, so. No, it's, no, it's, no, it's great. <laughs> Um, anyway, so my question was about, like, um, so before, like, after, like, whenever, okay. Um, do you have any advice for someone who is trying to get into this field but trying to apply for these jobs that ask you to submit um, examples of your work when I have done none? And I know that you literally just said, just do it, but is there anything a little bit more helpful than just do it? Um. <laughs> well, you did ask Kenneth about me, so I'm just going <laughs> to... Uh, uh, are you undergrad, graduate? Yes, I'm an undergrad. Like, I'm doing double two, physics and astronomy. So okay. I'm hoping that like the double be like, oh, she's interesting. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah, those are great people. She's interesting, she's tired. <laughs> yeah, so on campus there's opportunities. So the Daily Texan, go show up there, um, offer to be writing news stories, but ask, there's, I'm sure there's a ton of good science stories that are not getting in there because in general, people who work at the student newspapers aren't, don't have the science background to write interesting stories. So, and even there, the editors there, I imagine, want good feature stories, even if they're about science and engineering. There's an opportunity there. The other place to go knocking on a door is the news office for the university. Um, I don't know what the opportunities could be, but I'm sure they'd be excited that there's a student interested in helping them. And so they might give you an opportunity to work on a news release. That was a, that will work as a clip for get for getting an internship or a starting position. So when you go knocking on doors in New York, you can just give them a piece of paper too. So those are sort of things that start small, but they will give you the, the one the practice to figure out what works and what doesn't work, and two, those are the starting clips that you can do to get the next step. And, and many of my first clips oh, were. Sorry, oh, yeah. Uh, many of my first clips were self-published. Uh, what I turned in for my fellowship, um, and half of that was a package of stuff that I wrote and put it on the internet myself. And uh, I still, I still uh, judge those submissions for for that fellowship program every year. And a significant portion of the ones, the finalists, are turning in things that they themselves put out there. Um, you know, on on their own YouTube channel, on their, a podcast that they've started. 
know, articles that they're putting out there. But I do think there are always more opportunities that exist than, than, than what we initially realized because it's not, you don't get into the New York Times on your very first you know, day in the, in the business, but there are a number of, of uh, professional agencies, trade publications, regional news stories, newsletters for the community. I mean, there, there's a very long list of opportunities that, that are out there if you, you know, just don't feel like you're gonna get that New Yorker essay the very first time you go out there. And there is the opportunity of going to for more school. So there's several graduate programs in science writing at NYU, UC Santa Cruz, uh, MIT. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure you want another year of tuition that you want to pay, but <laughs> but those, that is an opportunity to, to get in to make that transition if, if that's what you're looking for. I didn't go to grad school, <laughs> and so there there to. are many different paths that you can take. But I will reiterate. I mean. Being at UT, I didn't work for the Daily Texan, but I did work for the TSTV, the student television station. And that was so, like, the barrier to entry that for that, they wanted you to volunteer. They wanted your help. So if the Daily Texan is anything like that, I'm sure that's the same way. Just take advantage of all the opportunities here of letting people, or of all the people here that want you to to try and experiment. This is your time to do that. And there are a, there are a ton of different opportunities here. So just find someone that will let you write for you and put it online. I mean, I, we... The, we didn't even have Twitter when I came to college here, so there's so many different you know tools that you have now to just put your voice on the internet, and I think that's all you need to just show show your work. And okay, let me echo Lauren real quick and just again reiterate that there's a lot of activity here on campus now, both formally through like the science communication minor, but informally as well. And so what I've kind of come to understand over time at UT is that the biggest barrier is just kind of connecting with a node in the network, if you will, and once you do that, you're in. So I would encourage you to send me an email. I would encourage you to send Roxanne, Roxanne, can you wait, Roxanne an email? Um, nodes in the science comm network here on campus that can help connect you with opportunities. Wait, email you a what? <laughs> Let's have coffee. <laughs> okay, sounds good to me, thank All you. Right. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Pratik, and I'm a third-year PhD student at Stan Richard School of Advertising. So, uh, <laughs> so one of my research areas is uh, heuristic processing. So that's where my question is coming from. So I, I do totally get that, as you mentioned, that uh, you know the, the consumption and the readers of science science communication have increased competitively. But right now, if you actually see, you know, it's the era of uh, like fast consumption, like an on-the-go consumption. So what I want to know is, how is that basically uh, creating a pressure, or if it is creating a pressure on you as, like, you know, science communicators and journalists, and what's the kind of pressure that it's creating, and and how are you guys dealing with it? I mean, how has it impacted the inverted pyramid? Well, I would say for me, there is that pressure to be first, 100%, and to get things up quickly, and so that your story is at the top of Google News or whatever. However, at the same time, I've also found that people really value ta you taking a step back and taking a long pause and looking at a story differently from a different angle. A good example for me was... Um, this one guy sent a bunch of tardigrades to the moon <laughs> without telling anybody. And uh, I am I tried not to pay attention to that story because I thought it was silly. But then after a while, I started to see a different angle. So people were really concerned about contaminating the moon, which there's a bunch of human poop on the moon, so you're fine. It's not going to get contaminated. But anyway, I, I was thinking, oh, you know what? The fact that he didn't tell anyone before he put these creatures on the rocket. I think that's the story. And so I wrote an analysis like 10 days later looking into that about, you know, space law and, and what kind of precedent that might have set. And that story was late, you know, by the, any definition. And it was one of our top read stories that week. And I think people still really appreciate you taking the time and taking a breath, talking to experts, doing that analysis. It doesn't matter. I mean, you, you don't want to write it three months later, but you still, you can take your time. And I, I found that even with, there is so much going around and, and so much going back and forth that people will really appreciate you 
um, being slow and being careful and, and doing the work that it takes. People have figured something out in the last few years that it turns out you can't fill up the internet no matter how much you keep putting into it. Um, <laughs> and I think that that has caused people to slow down and look for different ways to be valuable. Uh, and again, speaking just from, from YouTube, it, you know, we, we've seen a complete, sh well, the shift is not complete, but the shift is certainly happening of, it's something that I've started calling narrow casting, almost, you know, it's instead of this idea of, of, of broadcasting, trying to reach everyone with everything, but really trying to valuably serve smaller communities, but give them the absolute best piece of content that is directed solely for them. And they, they gather around it, they bond to it tighter, they wanna pay for it, which is great. Um, and, and they reward you for being not only um, you know, it more in depth, but but deliberate, um, and and it's a. It, I think these things move in pendulums, and we, we saw a race to be to be first and to fill up your website with every bit of content you could. But that for as as you know, Facebook has has changed why things are valuable. As news organizations have changed their their business models, we're all having to look for new ways to 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 create that value, that V word, um, and I think that that pendulum is swinging back in a really healthy direction about these these deeper, sometimes narrower approaches. Yeah, there's a conventional wisdom for the last 20 years that you know, everyone growing up now has the attention span of a flea, right? Um, and it was always this, it wasn't based on any data. Um, and in fact, I, probably five years ago, I actually started looking at which were the most popular science articles in the New York Times. Um, and they were roughly, it was roughly proportional or linear that the longer articles were the more interest, more the most, more read ones, not the short ones. Um, because maybe it's because, you know, if it's just a quick news thing, you already saw it somewhere else or, but that's where the value of the New York Times is. And so there is still, maybe it's not universal, but there is a large, readership that is still looking for longer, more in-depth things. And, and you have to take into account the medium. So you can't put a 10,000 word article, but you can still go in some depth if you layer it in different ways. You're probably not gonna do a three hour documentary on YouTube, but you can get five minutes, 10 minutes to end up and compared to a, a segment on um, World News Tonight, that would be eternity. Um, so I think that people are still interested in many different things at different levels. And that there's, you know, that's why the New York Times has like four million paying customers and not everyone's just going to USA Today or CNN.com. Right, thank you. Thank you for all the wonderful information as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, time for one more question. Come on up. Hi there, my name is Travis. I'm a fourth year journalism major, aspiring science writer. And I was just kind of wondering like how you're the more technical question, how your like writing processes and reporting processes differ from more standard forms of report or journalism. We bang our heads against the wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to think that we start off just like any other journalist, you know, um, regardless of the topic. Um, I'll, I'll start off with a tip or, you know, a, an angle that I want to write about. I look for experts to you know, explain to me what's going on, um, and then I try to do my research to to provide that context, like I was talking about. And then if I need more information, I'll call more people, which happens frequently. Um, so yeah, it's a um, fairly standard process, I would say. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's not fundamentally different from writing about any other topic. It is, uh, no, no, <laughs> for me. For me, it is. Um, it's. I work in a, in, a, in a narrative field. You know, everything is, is very story based. That requires a lot more, uh, a lot of challenge of context. Uh, and so I think when I write something that's an article, it's a more traditional piece. It, it's fairly straightforward. But um, in different kinds of media, you have to identify characters differently. You have to look for maybe deeper historical context, society relevance, jokes, um, things that that can fit in in traditional uh, journalistic um, writing styles, but uh, that process requires maybe a broader approach
to the question than trying to specifically communicate that story, that, that, that scientist, that issue. Um, it requires reaching out broader and, and in many times, like back into history and, and art and other kinds of, of things to connect it to. I'd also say it's scarier. <laughs> Sometimes I'll be, I'll have to write about a topic that I don't have as much experience in and having to boil that down, you know, like um, gravitational waves. That was a, a doozy when I first started reporting on that because I, ha I had no background in it. So it can be scary because it's, uh, you know, you're taking these really complicated topics and you're trying to be the expert yourself when you're not. And um, not to dissuade you from being a science writer, but um, it definitely, it, it takes a certain, a, def a, a different type of skill set of reporting for sure. I don't know, is that more complicated than trying to explain, like, the, the federal government? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, I would take the gravitational waves over that. What moves more, the gravitational wave or the federal government? <laughs> like, physically? Well, <laughs> the, the, gravi the gravitational well, waves well, move pretty fast. Well, Lago's not getting set off by any congressional progress any, anytime soon. <laughs> Sounds to me like we've got to the perfect place to wrap yeah. this up. <laughs> uh, before we thank uh, our uh, panel, uh, let me say uh, just a couple of personal remarks uh, uh, to Ken, Lauren, Joe, and Anthony. Uh, in me, and I'm sure in our uh, audience, you've triggered many uh, important and valuable thoughts, and I really thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, I really am impressed by the thoughtful and, and principled approach that you take to your, to your craft. And I think uh, we were confident in you already, but I think our confidence has risen uh, even higher. Uh, th there's two words that we like to use across the campus as words that bind us together, and they are uh, creativity on the one hand and reason on the other. And I think those are words that apply somehow across the whole campus. And I think you've exemplified those, and I think you exemplify them in your, in your work uh, very much too. So I'm really grateful for that. Let me wrap up by saying that I was very much encouraged by Joe, who said that he was pleased to say that things are actually moving and changing, and we're getting to grips with these wonderful issues. And it brings to mind the words of uh, Max Planck, who in 1900 discovered the quantum and ushered in the era of quantum mechanics. And he liked to say, uh, academia changes one coffin at a time uh, and I'm very pleased to hear that we're doing better than that. So thanks to everybody on the panel, thanks to you in the audience and please come back next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>